All right, so our next video for Math 2580 is going to be on limits and continuity. And we're going to look at, you know, just heuristic definition for the limit. Again, we won't try to get too technical here, but uh, we'll give some idea of the notion of a limit. We'll do another example showing how limits are a little bit trickier in several variables. Um, but on the other hand, the basic idea of a limit is, is not any different, right? So let's start with... Let's start with kind of the, the simplest case. And that's where most of the limit problems you see are gonna, are gonna fall. So let's say we have a function f and it's defined on some domain d in the plane. And it's gonna take values in the real number. So it's a real valued function, right? So in this context, we're going to write something like this. The limit has a point x, y, approaches a point a, b of f of x, y equals l. OK, so pretty much the same limit notation that you're used to. The only thing that changes is now your function depends on two variables rather than one. And so, of course, down here in the limit, we're dealing with points in R2 rather than points in R, because we have a, a function whose domain is R rather than R2. Um, otherwise, it's the same idea. So now you try, to, you try to unpack this, right? And you say, OK, so what does this mean? Um, so this means that we can make f of x, y, you know, what do we usually say? Something like arbitrarily close, right? So we'll say close to L by choosing the point x, y. And again, maybe we put sort of scare quotes around close. Uh, x, y is close to the point a, b. Right? Um, so, and usually what do we say here is like sufficiently close. Uh, so what does that, you know, what does that even mean in this context? And, and then there are some other technical issues that we might have to worry about. So the, the basic idea is this, right? Um, you have, there's, and there's two ways we might look at it, but let's look at it this way so I don't have to try and, and draw a picture in three dimensions here. Um, maybe we'll try that too. But here's our, um, here's our copy of R2, right? And we have our function f, which takes points in the plane and lands somewhere over here, right? Here's a copy of r. All right. So for a given point x, y, right, I apply my function f and I get a number, f of x, y which is somewhere on the line, right? But somewhere over here in the plane, I've got my point, my point AB. And somewhere over here on the real line, I've got my value L that I'm trying to get close to. Uh, so the intuitive notion with the limit is that if I, and I wish this was an interactive board, but you know, that's a lot more tech than we can afford. As, as I slide this point here towards the point AB, well, this point here should get closer and closer to the limit L, right? So as I slide this one, I should slide this one, right? Um, if you wanted to sort of unpack things, if you wanted to do things precisely, the way you make this precise is to say that, well, here you say, well, how close do you want it? And, and so the closeness here is, is measured by some sort of you know acceptable error, which is usually denoted by an epsilon, right? It's the it's the gap between these two numbers, and you say, well, I want to make that number small, um, and the way you make you know the difference, but you know, so we want to say close. So close means that we're making the difference small, right? So you want to make this difference less than epsilon, and the way you do that is by making sure that this point is close enough to that point. Uh, 
Well, how do you measure closeness here? Well, closeness is distance in the plane, right? It's, it's this kind of, this distance here. Um, so what is that distance? Well, that distance, you know, that's measured in the plane. We use our distance formula. X minus A squared plus Y minus B squared. And we want that to be less than some value that is usually denoted by a, a delta, right? Um, but, you know, the, the sort of boundary of this, of this condition here is, is just a circle. So what we're really saying is that we want to make sure that this point x, y lies within some disk. And that disk should have a radius of, of delta, right? And so the way you want to think about limits in the plane, and, and then if you're doing this in three dimensions instead of a disk, you're going to have a... a a sphere or a ball, right? The interior of a sphere. And the idea is that as you shrink this thing down, it's going to force these points to get closer and closer to AB. And saying that you have a limit means that as you shrink this disk, all the points within the disk should get closer and closer and closer to the limit L, right? This is what you're, you're requiring. Um, this gets a little bit trickier if you're dealing with, you know, four or more variables, you can't really visualize it anymore. And, and it's especially trickier if you're not dealing with a real valued function, but a vector valued function. So how do you sort of generalize? Um, so in general, right, if you have a, a function f going from a domain d in our n and taking values in, let's say, our k, right, we might write f in terms of its components, f1 up to fk. Um, or, or maybe what we do is we say, you know, let's, let's not think of it as a point. Let's think of it as a, as, as a vector, right? And change these two to angle brackets, right? So think of it as a vector-valued function. And, and think of, of the, the input, you know, x, you know, x is going to be x1 up to xn in d. Well, think of this as a vector too, right? So think of everything in terms of vectors. And then what's kind of cool is that when you're writing down your limit in this, in this notation, you might say something like this. You might say, well, we want the limit as x approaches a of f of x to equal l, right? Which looks like, you know, a 1560 limit, except we put some arrows on things. Um, and what would this mean? Well, this means that, you know, and, and here now we got to get into this issue of closeness. What does it mean for f of x to be close to l if these are vectors? Um, well, it means that we can make their difference, and then, you know, if we're going to try to measure size, we need what? We need magnitude if we're talking about size of vectors. So we can make the magnitude of, you know, I guess make that a vector too, f of x minus l, um, small, or, or if you like, less than epsilon, right, given, and this is, so, when we say arbitrarily close, we mean that, you know, anyone can choose any epsilon, any, well, positive epsilon. Um, you can make this less than epsilon by choosing, you know, your x such that the difference between x and a is also small, and we might specify how small by saying, well, it should be less than delta, right? So, this, aside from the arrows and the fact that we're using double bars for magnitude rather than single bars for absolute value, is exactly the same as the limit definition uh, in one variable. If you ever bothered to look at the formal definition of the limit in one variable, it looks something like this. We're not going to do limit proofs, so you don't have to worry about that. We're not going to do epsilon delta proofs for limits. Um, they get really complicated and messy. We, we don't want to go there. Okay. Um, the main, the main thing to keep in mind is that, you know, because you're now dealing with not just points along a line like you are in one variable where you can only approach from two dimensions or two directions, you know, 
you're dealing with points within a disk, and so now you know there's infinitely many ways that you can be approaching that point. This ends up complicating things. And you can never really be sure that a limit exists just by considering approaches along various paths because you know you can never account for all paths, not by you know you can't enumerate them. You can't do them one at a time. Um, the only way that you can really, really convince yourself that a limit exists is to go ahead and do one of these limit proofs, and we're not going to go there, okay? Um, but I will say one thing. What does continuity mean? Well, continuity is defined exactly the same way, and let's use this vector notation because it saves me some writing. In every context, continuity means, oh, this should be an x, that the limit of f of x as x approaches a should be the same thing as f of a, right? So continuity still means that you can evaluate your limit by direct substitution. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that because once you choose the right notation, the limit definition in several variables looks exactly the same as the limit definition in one variable. Um, all the usual limit laws are exactly the same, so all the limit properties are the same, all the continuity properties are the same, so it's still true, you know, that polynomials are continuous and, you know, so all the functions you expect to be continuous are still continuous, it's still true that if you add or multiply continuous functions or compose continuous functions, the result is continuous, right? So all the usual limit and continuity properties, they're still the same. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, there, are, there are a couple of other things to keep in mind. If you're reading the textbook, you'll notice that there's a lot of kind of technical detail in the preamble for the limit definition. And one of the things that they have to worry about is that if you're dealing with limits in more than one dimension, Domains and, and sets in general can look a lot more complicated. So this domain D, it might, it might look something like this, right? So maybe the domain D looks something like this. And the point that you're interested in is on the boundary of your domain, right? And it might not even necessarily be in the domain, right? We know that limits are mostly interesting when you're considering the limit at a point which is just outside the domain, right? It's on the boundary of the domain. Um, but Boundaries can be way more complicated in two or more dimensions, and so you have to kind of watch out for these things, right? And so if you're looking at the language in the limit, what they're doing is they're trying to be careful about saying, oh, you know, well, we consider disks around the point, but really what you're looking at is, is you know, the intersection of each disk with the domain. So really you're just looking at the points x, y that are in this region here where they intersect. Um, so if you're wondering about the technical language in the textbook, that's what it's referring to. Um, and so I'll probably on the first assignment, I might ask you to think a little bit about these different types of sets in the plane, open sets, closed sets, boundary points, interior points, some of these things. We won't, uh, we won't really make a lot of use of it in this course, but it's a good exercise and it's a useful exercise if you're thinking about going on to, let's say, analysis one in your next semester. Okay, um, that's it for limits and continuity. We'll do a couple more examples in class, um, playing around with this sort of limit here and with actual functions. And uh, next we're gonna move on to partial derivatives.